yeah, that works. Come in, come in, have a seat. All right. Um, yes. My name is Olivier Kai. I work for uh, Calabra, and um, I'm a GStreamer developer. Um, I came to GStreamer almost six years ago now, when I was when I was hired by Calabra to work on their uh, video calling solution which was at the time most an audio calling solution. And um, that solution is based on GStreamer. And at first, I just used GStreamer, like many people. But pretty soon, I started fixing a little bug, a mortal bug, and now I'm a developer and a commenter. So I'd be curious, how many of you here have used GStreamer? As an end user or as a developer? End users? Yes. Developers? And anyone has written an application using GNOME? No one. All right. GNOME, uh, GStreamer. Uh, so GStreamer is a library to make it easy to do multimedia applications. Uh, so it's used extensively on the desktop. Uh, it's used by a bunch of use cases to do a bunch of different things. So starting from uh, communications, video calls, video editing, uh, simple playback, uh, this is video call actually, playback, um, written box to media, uh, written box in Banshee, which is a uh, media players, Totem, Opera uses it for all of its uh, video things in Opera, the video, video tag. Also, so does uh, um, Epiphany, now called Web. Uh, WebKit GDK, WebKit Qt. So everything on the Migo platform was GStreamer, everything multimedia there. And uh, many other people use it. And it's uh, used a lot in embedded. For example, if you get an LG Smart TV, all of the internet media is GStreamer there. Uh, if you get an Axis security camera, that's GStreamer inside it. So a lot of product in the... Uh, Embedded world use GStreamer, and we don't even know it. And uh, this basically GStreamer can do all these things. So GStreamer is a library that goes in between your applications on top and plugins in the bottom. In fact, GStreamer, the core of GStreamer, does very li little. It um, mostly handles things like synchronization between different streams: audio, video, text, uh, metadata. Uh, it handles the plugins, loading the plugins. Uh, it provides a system for capabilities to describe what the plugins can do, but also describe what the current stream of data for a plugin is. So if it's MPEG audio, if it's uh, uh, that's a PCM with eight channels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it uh, has also a bunch of little. Uh, utilities to make it easy to write plugins. And uh, there's a message bus to talk to the applications because GStreamer is highly multi-threaded, but the application does not have to be. Uh, so it can be easily used by a simple single thread application. We have a lot of, of, of uh, plugins for almost every task out there. There's like 300 plugins in the core GStreamer um, repositories. But you can also write your own. Uh, many of the embedded users actually have plugins for their custom hardware. And it's pretty easy because we have base classes in the core to allow you to write like encoders or decoders or uh, things which are like places where you write data or sources, things that provide data. So we have all of everything that's like standard kind of desktop or mobile devices. We have so file, uh, HTTP, uh, RTSP streaming, we have full RTP stack, uh, we have all the codecs basically using open source things, but you can also get non-open source ones from some providers. Uh, we have a bunch of filters and effects and all kinds of things. Uh, we support basically every format out there. 
So on top of GStreamer, we also have some higher level APIs that we provide to make it easy to, even easier to write applications. So we have, there's that uh, Firestream, which is the one I wrote for video calls. There's something called GStreamer editing services to write a video editor. Uh, we have a streaming server for RTSP streaming. Uh, we have something called Playbin, which does playback. So it makes it very easy to write a, just a simple playback application or a complex playback application. So we have all of these things, and we have also some really useful command line tools for um, developers. So just inspect to just see everything that there's to know about a plugin or all the plugins. And you know, you can find which plugin does uh, uh, video mixing or find which which plugins do MP3s on your system. We have uh, various, um, and you can write simple pipelines which connect plugins in a command line and just run it. So it's very easy to prototype an application with that. So basically, GStreamer is plugins, and each plugin contains one or more elements. Uh, and the elements are already what the core of GStreamer is. So we have different types of elements, um, sources and sinks. Source provide data, sinks consume data, and we have elements that go in the middle. Example here is MAD. MAD is an MP3 decoder. So we put all of these elements inside a bin. A bin is just an element that contains other elements. And when they're inside a bin, they, um, you can handle them as one unit, change their state from like pause to playing all at once. And if you use the master bin called the pipeline, which is just a bin that provides some other things for applications, you also get everything in there synchronized. And the elements have paths. Uh, paths are the thing that you can connect between two elements. We have two things, two kinds of paths, source paths and sync paths, and you always connect a source pad to a sync pad. And the data always flows from source to sync, basically. So it's then you have a, a thing where the, the fossils will read the file, give it to the decoder, play it to the ALSA sync, for example. It will probably be, be pulse sync these days. So this is really what Bishramer is about. We um, have had version 0 0.10 for the last seven years. And it's been highly successful. It's used all these products I showed you. They were all built on Bishramer 0 0.10. But, uh, when we started 0.10, well, when, by we, I mean other people, because I wasn't involved back then. It's been a long time. When it started, it was a um, mostly aiming at the desktop. And on the desktop, things are pretty easy. Especially they, they were seven years ago, because we didn't have hardware decoders. Uh, we didn't have NVIDIA cards that can do issues explore. We only had one type of memory, system memory. We did not know much about DSPs and mobile platforms and embedded platforms. And GStreamer was, yes? I'm not sure what the open Moco people use, actually. Did we? No, uh, open Moco used some Samsung processor. Uh, the uh, OMAC processor was used, on, like the Nokia used it, for example. Uh, this is OMAC. Uh, Four, actually. So this is an example of a really complex um, mobile platform. The OMAP 4 processor has like 15 ARM cores in it. And uh, many of them are used for multimedia processing. So they have a separate processor for the camera. They have two hardware decoders for everything, hardware encoders, et cetera, et cetera. And these require a different memory banks. And like the video encoder really wants you to put some part of the image on one memory bank and another part on another memory bank. So there's many like requirements on these platforms. And this year, 0 0.10 was not designed for that. It was designed thinking there's only one type of memory, standard memory. And so this is why I have this like slide of this really complex device where you have all of these various things. And we were not ready to support that in 0 0.10, but people made hacks because embedded customers really wanted to have uh, GStreamer. That makes it so easy to write applications. But we listened to them, and we tried to fix that. So also, uh, GPU decoding is a big thing now. So all of your laptops probably now have some kind of uh, 
hardware decoder for H264. And even though Intel chips, they're more than capable of decoding H264 on the CPU, that's just a lot of power. So, and the hardware decoding is often much more power efficient. Uh, so GPU decoding we support now, both Intel and NVIDIA. Uh, we have GPU processing also. A lot of the time, you could do all this processing on your CPU, but you might want to delay it to the GPU to save power, or just because the GPU's not, CPU might not be fast enough. Uh, so we have smarter memory management, because if you do GPU decoding, then you need to have to copy the buffers to the GPU first before they can be decoded. The, data, and if um, that we're not really very good at that, now we have a way to represent memory that's remote from the main memory correctly, and also to not have to re-download everything after you decoded it, because you're going to do it on the screen anyway, so you might want to leave it there. We also support things like padding. So previously, we had a very simplistic view of an image, which was just the image itself. Now we can say we have this big memory buffer but only a part of it you will use for the image. The rest is padding, but some encoders really like to have free space around it, make them more efficient. Or we could also uh, do like um, have an image, like in, in, in this case, uh, this is a uh, typical uh, where you have the Y luminance information and the color information are separate, and that's been a weird memory layout, but it's harder to work. This kind of thing we can do. So. Better memory management in a multimedia firm is critical if you want good performance and integration with hardware. We have now also on each buffers, in the pipeline that I showed earlier, what traverses our buffers? GST buffer objects. And they represent either a frame of video or a frame of audio or some other thing. And uh, previously, they were kind of a static structure. And you could not have so much extra information on it. Now you can add arbitrary information to a buffer. So some of it is like, uh, for example, a plugin could analyze this picture, recognize the face, and do some analysis on it, and add this information to the buffer so that a later plugin will be able to use that information for something more useful. We have delayed processing. So with the metadata, we can also add information to a buffer, or add arbitrary methods to a buffer, saying, I uh, let's say we have an element that does cropping, but maybe the cropping you can do it on the GPU when displaying it. So the element will just maybe attach a, 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 a metadata to the buffer saying, actually, this whole buffer, only this region you're interested in. And we'll have a method saying, give me the memory for that region. But you might also use the, the sync, the GPU in the end when you display, but just ignore the rest and do it faster. So we can have like region of interest like that. Uh, also, this is the basically the things about buffers. Also, we have dynamic, more dynamic pipelines. When doing video calls, the um, we change uh, plugins and we reconnect things. Like if you're in a video call, someone else comes in. Previously, you could do H64, but this new person is on the. Fedora, so they don't have H264, so you want to switch back to VP8 and, and do that dynamically. In 0 0.10, it was all doable, but it was, there were a lot of little details that you had to know about. And uh, a lot of the little things were like, ooh, not really designed for that. We fixed almost all of these in 1.0. It's much, much, much easier to do. Uh, another thing Arun spoke about in his talk earlier. Uh, nowadays, we can do pass-through to Pulse Audio, which means that we can give Pulse Audio the MP3 data if you have hardware that can read MP3, like a Bluetooth headset, or we can let the Dolby Audio go straight to your uh, audio system if you have a hardware decoder, for example. And we have a way to dynamically negotiate that. So this also is, is related to easier dynamic pipeline because if you have audio pass-through, let's say, and you switch to your Bluetooth headset, then you want to remove the decoder from the software side and let the headset decode it. But if you unplug your Bluetooth headset, boop, you want to go back to the software decoder because now you want to play on the speakers. So all of these things are, are now very dynamic. 
the other big, big thing is that we have a GST memory object now. In 0 0.10, the GST buffer object just, just contained a pointer to memory. And that was it. There was a single pointer, and there was really expected to be allocated with malloc. In uh, 1.0, we have a much more flexible system where each buffer is con contains one or more memory objects, which can obviously be allocated with malloc, but which can have custom allocators, uh, which can be anything really, which you can write your own, your own plugin, your own application can have custom allocator for some special memory. Uh, the allocator can add padding at the, at the beginning or the end. Uh, we have a new way to control access. In 0 0.10, the access was controlled by the reference count. So if the reference count was one, then only you own the object, and then you could read and write to it. If the reference count was more than one, then other someone else also owned it, so it was read only, because you, you can't modify it once someone else is using it. So that worked very well for C. The problem is if you use a language like Python or like Java, each variable owns a reference to the object. So if you had in your function two variables that point to the object, and do only you own it, the reference count is two, and the whole thing would break down. So now in uh, 0, 1.0, for me buffer memory objects, we have explicit locking. So you do uh, you lock the object for writing, then it will say yes or no, and then you can uh, write and unlock. So it's, it's more explicit. And that also means that a memory object, if it's on on the GPU, if you just decoded a buffer on the GPU, as long as you don't explicitly map it, it will stay there. But if you explicitly map it, then it will copy it back to your main memory so that you can do software processing on it. Um, so a GC buffer will contain, may contain multiple me me memory regions. Typical case is YUV buffers would be separate, or uh, RTP. So the payload is actually often plain encoded data. And what, what we had to do in 0 0.10 is that we had to allocate a bigger buffer, add the header, and then mem copy the entire uh, payload, and then maybe add some padding in the end. Now, with 1.0, we just create three separate smaller memory objects, meaning that there's no mem copy needed. And this entire thing can go to the network sync, where the kernel will read the three different parts separately to the, without ever doing a mem copy. So we can have the entire video call pipeline without ever doing a memory copy, which is very good if you're an embedded and you want to do HD, let's say. Um, so all of these things are linked together. So the JST buffer, which contains extra metadata and also contains the um, memory objects. So what's JST meta? JST meta is the thing to add extra metadata to a buffer. So we can add extra properties. Some of them are standardized in the core. Um, for example, timestamps. Uh, so, so there's some uh, core interfaces, but you can have multiple implementations of them so that uh, your own plugin can have different behaviors related to that. Um, just meta can also contain operations. I'll talk mostly about being data, but some of them, like in the crop case, for example, uh, the information is just the rectangle, but you can have an operation, please crop it for me. Which means that you only crop it when needed. And if you actually add crop and then don't do anything that requires cropping, then the CPU will never be used. Um, what other enhancements do we have? Buffer pool, in many cases, you don't want to reallocate buffers for every, every, uh, every frame. You can have a limited number of buffers, maybe six, seven, three, and that you can reuse once you're done with them so that you uh, can save allocation because on many systems, malloc is uh, non deterministic. So it can be very fast or much slower. No way to guess that. So by using a buffer pool, we always reuse the same buffers. Uh, the buffer pool will probably most, the default implementation will only allocate buffers when needed. And 
So you will not allocate more than is required. But they could also be pre-allocated from the start. Uh, for example, on some hardware platforms, you actually have like four buffers, no more, no less. And then it's very much easier with a buffer full to represent that in GStreamer, and it just works. Um, we can query what kind of memory is supported. We can query what kind of metadata is supported at runtime. So that, let's say, if you have an application, and uh, it's a PC application, so you don't know what kind of PC people would run on. Is it an NVIDIA GPU? Is it an Intel GPU? Is it none of the above, and you all do it in software? And now the application can dynamically query it, query capabilities. Not only is it Intel, but the capability can it uh, do rendering like OpenGL or something like that. Uh, video can have arbitrary strides and padding. That means that video buffers on many systems, many formats, uh, have slightly different formats that are exactly equivalent, but just slightly different to make it annoying. And we can much more easily represent these things now. Uh, also, my favorite one is that in 0 0.10, buffers, event queries, they are G objects, well, G type instance, which is the same thing as a G object, a base class of a G object. And it meant that every time you create one, you have to take a global one. And in many GStream applications, that was the top case of contention was that global lock on the creation of any kind of object in your application. Nowadays, in 1.0, the buffers, the event, and the queries no longer are, are G-type instance. They're just regular C structures. And you don't need to create a lock to create them. And everything is a lot faster. Uh, so what... I said dynamic pipelines. But what can we do more as we couldn't do before? First, contact is kept on the path. In 0 0.10, the context, information about timing, for example, w was sent once down the pipeline, and every element had to remember it. And have like some custom code, and accumulate it, and do a bunch of processing. It's kind of complicated. Now, in 1.0, the, uh, the, the events stick to each path. And so you can get it back from the path very easily. And that means that as an, as a, if you remove an element and add a new element in its place, you don't have to do special things to get that information because it's on the, the next path and it just flows back when it's reconnected. Uh, so yes, yeah, so the context is passed. Also, renegotiation in 0 0.10 was very complicated and was tied with buffer allocation and was basically unusable. In 1.0, it's just an event. So what I mean by renegotiation is that in a GStreamer pipeline, the different elements actually negotiate what type of data is going to flow. So if you have pulse source from pulse audio, that can produce any kind of audio data because pulse audio can transform it. And you don't really know the hardware will produce it anyway. But then you could have a Vorbis encoder, and that requires flow 32, for example. So the whole so it would negotiate so that Pulsar would produce the right of kind of data for your encoder. And, but if you replace Vorbis encoder with, let's say, an MP, MAD, uh, MAD, FAD, an MP3 encoder that wants I integer samples, then in 0 0.10 it was very painful. You had to stop everything and restart it again. In 1.0, you can just replace it and then send an upstream event and dynamically the source will change what it's currently producing. Uh, we also have other things like in, uh, if you try, that works in 0 0.10, but it's very, very complex. So it's much easier. If you have a camera and a um, window, you could change the size of the window by dragging it, and what the camera captures will change with it so that you don't capture more than you need. Um, the different resolutions will change. So pad probes. On the pads, you can add a, a probe which will call you every time something of interest passes through the pad. In 0 0.10, you can only probe events and uh, buffers and only when they want one way and you could not modify it. You could just look at them. In 1.0, you can do a lot more. 
you can query, you can uh, probe any type of information. Events queries, when they go one way, the other way, when they go, when they come back, you can modify them, uh, and you can also use it for blocking. In, in 0.10, you could have a, a special callback that was different from a pad probe, call when a buffer arrives, and that will block the pad, the processing, so that you could do dynamic changes. Now it's all in here in the pad probe, so when you get, sure, you can block, when you get a, a, a buffer and block the processing in the pipeline, but you can also uh, modify the event and at the same time, or the buffer, and maybe just drop it. Maybe say, hmm, this buffer, I, want to, I don't like it. Okay, you can ignore it. So you can do a lot of different things now in uh, 1.0 with the very flexible path probe system. Also, another favorite of mine, let me forget that one. In, one, in 0 0.10, you can only be notified when data arrives. Now you can also be notified when there's no data, which is very useful if you want to do a modification, so that you can do modification as early as possible when no data is flowing through your pipeline when it's idle. Uh, also, the capabilities. I mentioned earlier that we have a system to describe what data goes through. Uh, it hasn't changed much since 0.10. But some of the formats, we made it much more simple. For RGB video, for example, we had a, a system in 0 0.10 where you could describe any arbitrary RGB format by having masks for the which bits are used for which color, uh, what's the Indianness, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it turns out that despite having an incredibly flexible format, people only use like 12 or 13 formats. So we just made it much more simple, and you have a string that represents the format, and that's it. That's uh, and we have a, a library that, from that string, can give you this other information, so that you can have a right flexible element that does not know the, any of these formats. Just says, oh, it's 15 bits per sample, per per pixel. So I can just do it every 15 bits without having to know what it is. But you can also say that actually. I'm just wrapping an external library in my plugin, and my library only supports three formats, and then you don't have to do have all these complicated things. You can just write the name of the format directly. And it's also much easier for debugging as an uh, application developer, because in 0 0.10, we had, if you had a, a many format, you had this giant thing, and then you had 15 of them, and then you were like, ooh, what are these formats? And you have to read them and really understand what they were. Well, if they're called like RGB 15, RGB 16, RGB 24, and it's very easy to just see directly what's going on. Um, next is language bindings. GStreamer can be used from C. It's written in C, but it can also be used from many other languages. Uh, in 0 0.10, we had custom handwritten bindings for the different platforms, for different languages. So we have Python binding, we have Perl bindings, we have Vala, we have uh, Objective C, um, not Objective C, um, C sharp bindings, and you had to have basically a team of people work on each bindings for each element of the GNOME path platform. In GStreamer 1.0, we use something called GObject Introspection. It is a system where we have a parser that reads through the uh, header file of the object and generates an XML description of the API. And that uh, XML description can then be used by various language bindings to uh, generate the bindings on the fly. If you're Python, let's say, any JVM illustration library will have bindings for Python without having to write any Python code for any of these. But then the same description, XML description, can be loaded by the Perl binding, or by the Java bindings, or by any other binding, or the JavaScript bindings. And that means that from that we have much wider coverage. It also means that a lot of the things that we had in the, in the previous bindings, which were like, we had a, some very specific Pythonic things to make it much more friendly to Python programmers, well, we've loved it, these things. So that's, that's a bit sad, but slowly they are being re-added in a different form in a pure Python form, where we just have some override for existing uh, objects. 
also another important thing, the old and the new bindings, the old bindings were compatible with, GTK, with the GTK2 Python bindings, but not the GTK3 Python bindings. And you could not use both in the, in the same application. That's a bit of a disaster from our Python GTK people. And so the new GTR 1.0 are compatible with the GTK3 bindings, but not the GTK2 bindings. So that is a bit sad. But uh, hopefully in the future, it will make our lives easier for everyone. Actually, I've said that doing Python bindings is a bit, a bit of a regression. They are a bit, but it's very easy to port applications. We have some very large GCU applications within Python. For example, PTV, the video editor, it's all Python. It's hundreds and thousands of lines of Python, and it was ported from GTK 0. GTK 2 and GStreamer 0 0.10 to GTK 3 and GStreamer 1.0 relatively painlessly. A lot of it is just slight different in the names in the functions or etc. This also means that the new bindings are much closer to the C API. So you can use the document for the C API and it's almost a one-to-one -to, -one to the new bindings. Uh, so all the major applications that have been ported by now uh, so, Totem, Rhythmbox, uh, Rigel, the DNA Suites, um, Empathy, the video call application, uh, etc., etc. Shotwell has been ported. Uh, I believe that, like in GNOME 3.6, the latest release in Fedora 18, um, almost everything uses this year 1.0. Uh, so, all, most of the changes I, I described really are for plugin developers. If you're an application developer, the API has barely changed. It's mostly a matter of recompiling it. If you're a plugin developer, because all, all the changes I described to how memory is handled, how the buffers are handled, that's a bit more work. But it, it's certainly not that hard. I've ported personally over 20 different plugins. And uh, once you do one or two, then it's very, very easy. So we are still maintaining 0 0.10, and we expect them to run in parallel for a bit. Uh, 0 0.10 is only bug fixes. Uh, so we have a, a, we now have a policy for how to end all these things. Previously, we had only a single series, 0 0.10, and new versions came with new features and bug fixes. And so it was a bit painful for people like embedded developers or people who built a uh, an application wanted to only have only bug fixes in the, from their existing version, but not new features, so that they could like keep a stable version. So they had to manually backport things. It was a bit annoying. Now we have a, a two-tiered development cycle. So we have unstable version and stable versions. And on the stable release branches, we only backport patches and bug fixes from the stable version, so a bit like the Linux kernel. Uh, right now, we have two stable versions running in parallel, 0 0.10 and uh, 1.0. That was released a couple of months ago. And all the active development is on 1.1, which will lead to 1.2.0, which will also be a stable version. Um, I should mention that uh, 0 0.10, we may not have new releases, but people keep on backporting things to the tree because we use them. Uh, I should also mention that one point we will have a new bug fix releases probably as the time goes. And for contributors, we have a strict rule now that anything that's proposed for an old for a stable version must first go into development version so that we can make sure it works, and also so we can make sure that uh, we don't have regressions. Obviously, we don't, we don't want the bugs to be fixed in the old version and not in the new version. Um, the other big change that we had in the GStreamer world is that now we have the GStreamer SDK. It's a, a corporate project that is financed by Collabora and Fluendo. Uh, Collabora is a company I work for. We do consulting. Fluendo is a company that provides non-free codecs with patent licenses, uh, which are sadly a reality in this world. So uh, what we do with the SDK is that we provide binaries that are tested, that have backported 
bug fixes for the four platforms that we currently support. So uh, the, the, the first version of the SDK supported Linux, Windows, Mac. The newest version also had the Android support. We released that two days ago. So it's relatively easy to have your multimedia core of your application be the exact same code on all of these platforms. And only the, the platform specific elements will change. Uh, so, in a, even a really complex application, it's only maybe like, if that, like a couple lines of code, like select Android source or the Mac source or the Windows source or the Linux source. Um, on Android, now we have support for basically everything. So, we have hardware uh, codec APIs on Android 4.1. API appeared. We support audio with OpenSLES. We support displaying video with OpenGLES. We also have uh, uh, support for the Android camera API, android.hardware.camera. So you can capture to your digital application. So we have the whole spectrum. Um, you might notice there's no iOS there. Uh, we are currently investigating that. There are some elements upstream to support iOS, so I don't know if they're really an SDK. But um, I should also mention SDK is commercially supported by Clever and Fluendo, so for corporate users we uh, provide the support. Also, the Tsushima SDK has a lot of backported bug fixes, and we really care to make it super stable. Uh, like it's more stable than the stable releases from upstream probably, because we're very, very, very aggressive making sure we don't have regressions for our developers. Uh, I also like to thank uh, some people. Uh, first, Win Tamens. He is the main GStreamer developer. He wrote a lot of the GStreamer 1.0 code and 0 0.10. And uh, he also did about two thirds of the slides I presented today. Um, basically, he's been working on GStreamer full time for quite a while now. And that was sponsored by Calabra, my employer, his employer also. So they've been investing a lot in GStreamer, and, the S and especially being upstream. And obviously the rest of the GStreamer community who have been doing an amazing job in the last two or three years. Shoot, can you do it? Any questions? Don't be shy. No questions. Yeah, sorry. There's a graph that you can create. Yes. How complex is that graph? Is it about things like loopback or? Uh, the graph cannot have loops. That's basically the only restriction. Ah. Um, if you want to do loops, it, it gets a, more comp a lot more complicated because then it comes from forever. Yeah. But yeah. there are ways to do loops by cheating. Keeping copies of old buffers, in hmm? keeping old copies of buffers, or, or you, uh, you can keep copies of the buffers, yes, because they're reference counted objects. Yes. Recommend for what? For embedded. Um, depends. Depends. I would recommend 1.0 normally, uh, because we have a, there's a lot of. Uh, features to make it easy to uh, work around uh, hardware uh, restrictions that you have in embedded. That said, uh, it's not currently supported in the SDK. SDK is still 0 0.10. So 1.0 is often a bit more to the head, so it depends on your deadlines. If you're doing something that's going to be released in one year, let's say, then you should definitely go 1.0. If you need something that, if you have a, if your deadline like next week, you might want to go 0 0.10. Oh, yeah, I should mention there will be no new features in 0 0.10. And so, so, yeah. So, you mentioned support for, uh, so is there a different category for GPU filters? Uh, are the GPU filters, because the GPU filter will have memory buffers in the GPU, yeah. I suppose, right? Yes. So that, so, that means all the data flows in the GPU till the point it's necessary to come back to the CPU. Yes. So, it, that's a separate class in itself. Yes, but uh, in 0 0.10, if 
it was a separate class, uh, okay. kind of. In 1.0, we've really integrated it, and in a way that the buffers, you don't really know where, the application doesn't have to know where they are, I and see. only if you actually need them on, on, on the CPU will they be re-downloaded. But the, uh, it should be transparent in 1.0. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I'm fairly new to this, this, and I wanted to know about the flow. I mean, actually, uh, okay. So you are uh, using Python, right? So my Python uh, is is taking data from GStreamer, and the rendering part is responsible for Python itself, right? Or GStreamer will do it itself. Normally, you try to not get the data out of GStreamer. Uh, we have syncs that render to various types of uh, uh, outputs. So we have like an OpenGL sync that will render to a buffer, or clutter sync to a clutter actor, or a X image sync or X image sync to a X window. So ideally, you would uh, not get it out of your pipeline to render it. But we also have app sync and app source that allow you to uh, get the buffers out of GStream or into your application. But obviously, um, Python is a bit slow. So if you want to use it on every frame, it might not be a good idea. But you can also write a GStreamer uh, plugin in Python or in any other object-oriented language where, where we have bindings, except for JavaScript because it's not really object-oriented, right? But you can subclass objects in JavaScript. Okay, thanks. Uh, could you suggest some uh, like uh, documentation or something which would be? Oh yes, I should mention documentation. GStreamer.freedesktop.org, the GStreamer website, has um, a tutorial, docu reference documentation for functions, an applications writer manual, a plugins writer manual, etc. Also, the GStreamer SDK and GStreamer.com has a really nice tutorials that we've written recently. Also, if you do more advanced things, once you've read all of this basic documentation, in the source code, in docs, design, there is a detailed design documentation. If you want to do all the details about how the seeking works, how the uh, threading model is designed, how the locking model is designed, everything is really well documented there. But uh, it's not the first documentation you should read, obviously. Anyone else? I think Leonard had a question, no? So it's. We're very agile. The question was, do we use agile or waterfall? We're very agile. We uh, we jump a lot, and we do a lot of sports. Anyone else? All right. Then I guess it's time for lunch. Um, there is a small announcement for uh, delegates. Uh, the delegate kits are being distributed.